Okay. Uh, where was I when, when we got disconnected? Um, somebody can let me know. So I might have been talking for a minute longer. So this angle is given. So that if this is the resultant of these two, it's not drawn to scale, but this is given by the tangent of FRY over FRX, the same thing that we did for vectoral analysis. It's just uh, summing up these uh, ve uh, vectors. All right. So let me go move ahead. I want to finish this chapter by the end of today. Why don't we do this problem quickly? So let, let's do another problem. So that we're comfortable. So let's say if we have that present again and we want to pull it. Example 11. Newtons. And we don't pull it exactly normal, right? Whenever you uh, pull on something, it's always at an angle, right? Here, we have the present is kind of small to where we're standing up. So we're pulling it downwards like this, 30 degrees. We're pulling upwards 30 degrees, right? And what is this? So for part A, what is the acceleration of the box? What is the net acceleration? And then part B is what is the normal force on here? And we write down everything that we know about the problem. We know that the mass is 10 kilograms. It's the same present that we had before, right? And this is the magnitude of the force that we pull it at. And this is the angle. Uh, so that's all that's given. So if we look at our free body diagram, let's draw our free body diagram. So if we draw it from here, right, we'll simplify it. This is a kind of pain in the butt because we're drawing all the different parts of it, but let's consider that. We need to have our axes. Right. So well, one, let's draw where the forces occur at. We have FP. We have Fn, Fn, and we have Mg or uh, force due to gravity. And that's all the forces in this problem, right? Now let's redraw this as a free body diagram. So here we're just taking the axes. Right? So we just say that the for we can move these force vectors around. So we have one FP over here. We have an FN over here. 
And then we have uh, the, uh, FG or uh, MG, if, if you want to label it that way, right? And it's much easier to work with this because now we can actually see what forces cancel out with each other and which directions they're in. When we write it at the same origin over here, it's not very clear, right? You have this Fn over here, Fg comes from the middle because it's blood everywhere, and Fb is attached at this corner. It's much better looking at this because this is the net force. We don't rotate the box, the box doesn't deform at all. It, all these objects are uh, what's called plutonic solids. They're rigid, they don't move, they don't extend. Um, and uh, so they're perfect, they're non deformable. So then that allows us to write it like this. And then we can see that FP has a vertical component in the Fn direction, and this will cancel out gravity, right? And then we could see just from this problem that there will be a net uh, acceleration in this direction. Will, be, will there be a net acceleration upwards or downwards? Anybody? No. No, because, um, well, one, we don't, we, we don't, we're not applying enough force to lift up the object. And two, Fn will always cancel out any of the remaining force caused by gravity, right? So only, we'll only have acceleration in the x direction, right? And this is this useful property of the normal force, right? It will always apply an equal uh, force, um, you know, in the same direction as the normal vector. This was increased uh, until we until it's greater than Fg, then it would change things and we get an acceleration. So let's do the acceleration. All right, let's write it out for each dimension. So well. Well, the acceleration consists of a x. I'm just writing this out to show it. All right, and now two-dimensional case. It's just a linear combination of these two quantities. So let's figure this out. We break it down into components. So the sum of the forces in the x direction is equal to the acceleration times the mass of the object in the x direction. And then this is just equal to Fp times what? Cosine or sine theta that we want to use here? If we look over here. Cosine? Cosine, right? That would give us the component in this direction. So we want to use cosine. Cosine 30, right? And then in the y direction, Right. We'll have Fp times sine, because that's the opposite, uh, the, um, the leg that's opposite to the angle that's given to us, minus, or, or let's do plus Fn minus Fg, and then I'll just write it as Mg. Okay. So these are the two equations, right? So, um, well, one, let's make sure that this is, that the force is not enough to lift up the object. This is 40 newtons. If you remember, this is 10 newtons. And from the previous problems, this comes out to about 100 newtons, 98, right? So we cannot lift up the object. So then that means that it's not going to be accelerated upwards like, I, like we just said. But now we, we can show it explicitly that it won't lift up, right? So there won't be any acceleration here because 
the uh, normal force will cancel uh, the rest out. Otherwise, it'll go through the table. Right. So here, so here we could say that a y is zero, right? And then a x is we just solve for a x over here, and that's this quantity times m. I'm going to erase this, and this is equal. Two three point six three point four six meters per second squared. And then we know a is, uh, y is zero. Right? So this is the total force. So that means that acceleration vector is equal to this. I and then I'll draw a zero for J. This is the answer for A. Right. Now for B, uh, what is this normal force where we keep this constant? We just solve this problem now. Right? We set A Y to zero and then we could equate the other two. So the normal force, when we bring this to the other side, is just equal to Mg minus F B. And don't worry that this is not opposite. The, the negative sign is not, um, this, al this almost looks like it's in the same direction as the gravitational force, but we included the direction in the sign, so it works out so, so that this will stay positive because we started off with a negative mg over here. So we, we reverse the sign of it and this, would be the normal force required on on the uh, presented by the table. This comes out to be seventy eight newtons. That's it for this problem. So let's do the next problem. Any questions on this, actually? Okay. Now, let, let's say if we have two boxes, that we're pulling along, and we're using a string to connect the two boxes. And now we're pulling this with a string vertically, and this is 40 Newtons. And The boxes each have a mass of 12 kilograms. We'll call this box one and this box two. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. This is 10. Make that 10. And We'll call it A and B, box A and box B instead. We'll follow the book. Um, okay, so the first question is find A, A and A, B. Find the acceleration of A and the acceleration of B. And we're going to assume that it's frictionless. So 
so they glide along without any friction. So well, wouldn't their acceleration be the same since they're tied together or no? Yes. Well, let, let's not assume that, but yes, your your into your, your intuition serves you, uh, in right here. Yes, it, it will be the same, and let's explicitly show that. So, how can we show that ex that ex explicitly? Right, that's the question. We want to take our intuition, what we know about the world, and and show that it works in every situation. Right. It could not work, right? Uh, for thousands of years, people assumed that um, objects like to stay at rest, right? And this happens not to be a universal law, but only when you deal with friction that opposes any motion, right? Where objects like to stay at rest because you have this other force to slow it down. But in general, objects will stay at that velocity. So we always want to back up our intuition with. Um, uh, the mathematics and the equation. So let's do that. That's the hard part about it, right? We, we guide up. Uh, we use our intuition to guide us, but we we find our ultimate solution using uh, logic, right, or, or, and mathematics. So let's do that. And then the tension in the cord. This is the tension, call that T. Or so if I ask you this question, what was the first thing that you want to do? So I'm asking you to find the acceleration. How would we go about solving this? Let's take off the swimmies and dive right in. If, I, if this is the test right now, right? And I gave you this problem. F equals ma. Yeah, let's write down some equations, right? We have F is equal to ma, right? It's a good start. What else do we want to do? I guess you could just determine the acceleration acting on box A to start. Okay. How do we do that? Good. We're breaking down the problem. Okay. Um, so you just divide the force by the mass of the box. What force? Uh, the, on the rope. 40 newtons. So, so I set up this equation, right? So we, we, you're saying that we have this right now, right? And th this is in the x directions. You say that we have this equation, right? Where um, is, th is this equation true? Yes. Yeah, uh, was... Well, let's consider it, right? What are the forces? Uh, acting on box A. Let's enumerate them. So let's draw it. So for box A, what are the forces? Okay. So you have FP and you have the tension of the rope. Yes, we have FP. I'm just going to draw it from the center. FP. What else? Any, any other forces? The tension from the rope. That's right. And the tension from the rope, right, like I said earlier, is always facing the direction of the rope. So it's going in, it's going in this direction, right? So this is opposite. Right? Well, is there any other forces? Force of gravity, and then yep. force of the ground. Yep. We they cancel out. G and then Fn. And they cancel each other out. And we don't have to worry about friction, right? So for A, well, let me just write down A like this. 
So in the x direction, right, we have fp minus ft, right? Let me label the axes. It's the same standard ones we've been using. We have this. And then in the y direction, In the x in the y direction, we have the for or new, uh, normal force minus Fg, which is just equal to uh, mg, right? I'm sure, like this. We know that that's zero, right? That's not taken into account. But these are the forces, right? So this is the for. These are the forces on the first box, right? So let's solve, solve it. So now how do we solve this? It's, it's like, uh, I think it was Dan who said this originally. I know your voice now. Um, we just solve for x, uh, ax. Let me put a little a in here, uh, subscript a, so we know we're talking about um, box A is equal to FP minus the, for, the tension force over MA, this one, right? And this is the, the force and when we know that MAY is zero, right? So this is the acceleration and then we just plug in the numbers for the tension force. Can we actually calculate this right now? Can we actually explicitly calculate the acceleration? So what are, what, what are the knowns and unknowns? FP is known and then M is known. M is known. So we don't know FT. FT. And A. And A. So we have one equation, two unknowns. So we need another equation. Where can we get this other equation from? Where do you think that uh, we can find this force attention? We from the other box? Yes. Let's check it out now. Let's, let's look at the other box. Maybe the other box will provide this tension force, right? So let's, let's do the free body diagram of the second box, right? I'll do the Y's real quick. It's the same thing, right? It's on friction, uh, friction in the surface, this Fn. Now what about the forces in the X direction? Where are they? What forces are there? Just the uh, force of tension, I That's think. That's right. We have the force of tension, right? And remember, the tension force is always in the direction that the rope is connected to that object with. So here, the, the tension force is in the opposing direction, right? It's this way now. And um, it's safe to assume that this rope doesn't stretch or pull, it's rigid. It's massless. We assume that there's no mass associated with this rope, right? And what this means is that the tension on one side is equal to the tension on the other side. So the, these two uh, tension forces, you could assume, are equal and opposite based on, on the fact that it's, there's no uh, elasticity and it's massless. Right? So we can say that these two FTs are the same. They're going opposite. So let's do the forces on B. I'll try to fit it in over here so we can have it all. So on B, right, F of X, the sum of the forces in the X direction, right, is equal to just the tension force, right? only have one force in this problem. So then we solve for B, 
and we get ft or, or we get this equation right m times a b x is equal to the tension force Right. Now what we could do, we're not going to assume that these two accelerations are equal to each other, right? But we, we're still going to find this tension force. The way we're going to do this is a little trick. I'm going to erase the free body diagram. Okay. We're going to say that the sum of the, we're going to say, we're going to look at the sum of these two forces. The, the sum of the force on A in the X direction plus the sum of force on B in the X direction. What these two quantities will do when we add them up together, they don't really represent anything physical so far in the fact that we, now we get to relate these two FTs together. So when we sum it up, we get this. All right, and this is equal to oh. All right. And we can see that the two FTs cancel out. And here we're kind of looking at this whole system as a whole, right? And these two, the fact that these two cancel out is kind of saying that um, uh, as a whole, this tension has an equal and opposite force, right? On each side from uh, the tension exerted from A on B and vice versa, All right? Now, now if this string remains taut, what it should do, given that it's a frictionless surface, and there's no elasticity, the fact that it's taut implies that A and B always keep the same distance. So this distance between the two never change, which means that they move in unison. And from this, we can assume that the two accelerations are equal, right? We're not just saying that we're given exact reasons. Well, the displacement between the, the, the separation between the two boxes never change. So that means they have to go on the, the same acceleration. If, uh, if it's change in position, both change the same way, right? So that means that the acceleration has to be the same, right? So now we could say that MA plus MB is equal to AX, and this is just equal to FB. Now we got rid of the tension, right? Of course, let's erase this. And we could calculate AX to be FB divided by, right? And what is this equation saying? What, what are we saying right here, right? This is looking at these two boxes as the same system, right? What's the difference between 
doing what we did and just saying that we have one big box. We don't know what's going inside of this box, but we have one big box and it has a net weight of both of these two masses. It's the same, it, we, we, we reached the same conclusion, right? So we, we can kind of break these systems up into smaller pieces and we'll reach the same uh, answer, right? So it, it, this would be the same as if we had one big box at 22 kilograms, instead of having these two small boxes connected to one another, right? And then the acceleration is equal, if we plug in the numbers, it's equal to this, right? And then what, what is this force? What is this tension force? Ft, well, now we could plug it in uh, to either the equation for B or A. Let's do B because it's just easier since it's only uh, the acceleration. So it's MB times AX is equal to Ft, right? So the, all, all the, the tension and the strain is only determined by box B. And this makes sense because it's what's causing the tension is the inertia of box B under the, this force, right? So that's what provides the tension. And then the full tension over here is related to both of these masses, like we did up here. So then for FT, we solve for FT. We just got to plug in the numbers for mass and acceleration, and we got 21.8 newtons. Okay. And that's it for that one. Okay. All right, we have enough time. Now we could use this idea as uh, of tension that we could translate these uh, uh, forces in different directions, and we could use this to our advantage. And this is used in buildings all the time, and we really mastered this quite well. So let's say if we have an elevator, right? And you want to lift up objects, right? So we have a mass of the elevator, we have an elevator, and it's about 1,000 uh, uh, kilograms, right? Now, we want to lift this elevator as easily as possible, right? Now, we could apply a force always, right? Let's say if we have a reel, and we turn this wheel, right? We have a crank that we could raise this up, right? Now we could lift it up by applying this tension force that's equal and opposite. We have to apply a tension force that's roughly mg, mEg, right? To cancel out gravity. We need to cancel out gravity to stop it from, so that it doesn't accelerate, accelerate it downwards. Then we have to apply more tension to lift it up, right? Now we can always apply this tension down here, but we can do something else. We can apply a little trick, right? Because this rope is connected like this. If we put a weight over here, let's say, a counterweight, now what happens? Let's say if we make this counterweight 
a thousand kilograms, right? So that means, so neglecting any force that this person applies. So that means there's a force moving downwards of MGC, right? And if you look, this will, this force due to gravity on this side for the counterweight will cancel out the force uh, of gravity on the elevator, right? By this rule, right? So if we just left it alone, the tension force over here, right? And this is static, it's being held up. The tension force would be MGE, right? And then the force due to gravity, and over here, it would have the same tension force. But what is the tension force over here? If we sum up all the forces over here, the tension force, let's do E for elevator, and then we'll do F T P for person. Right, the tension force over here on, on this side of the rope, the tension force over here is this tension force minus the counterweight, right? Because the counterweight's providing part of the tension force to keep this upright, right? If, this, if these two were equal and we're missing this rope, it wouldn't move, right? Because they're connected by the rope and uh, it would, they would have the same uh, gravitational force and tension force resisting each other, right? So we use this counterweight to move objects larger than, uh, 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 larger than what we normally would be able to move. And we would just have to apply a force that subtracts the force due to the counterweight, right? And let's explicitly look at it. So we have the force of the tension over here, force of gravity, and then we have this force and the force of uh, gravity of the counterweight. And um, let's figure out the acceleration of, of the elevator, right? Without without any any force from me pushing up on it, right? So let, let's calculate the acceleration of the elevator with just the counterweight, right? So right now, because the, the rope is taut, we can say that these two accelerations are equal to each other. So we can say that these two accelerations are equal to each other, right? So let's set up the equations. Right, and this is really a one dimensional problem, right? It's just that we're using this pulley to, to transfer the forces in the other direction. So, if we kind of like reverse it upwards, that would be our direction. Our direction motion is actually like this, right? So, even though this force is, is upwards, it, is in this, it looks like it's in the same direction as this tension force, really. Because of the pulley, they're in opposite directions. We consider this as our direction. Right? So let's say for the counterweight. So it'd be FT minus MCA. We'll just call it A. We know that the acceleration is equal to each other. And this is equal to MC. Hey, okay. oh, I wrote it wrong. 